Turn your uh, Bibles to Luke 2. Luke 2. And the part of the scripture I'm going to be focused on is found there in Luke 2, verse 10. If you'll turn your Bibles to Luke 2, the part of the scripture I'm going to be focused on is Luke 2, uh, verse 10. And of course, if we're turning to Luke 2, then we know this is a Christmas message. And, uh, you know, last year I didn't preach one. You know, it's not every year that you're going to preach one. But when you do, uh, you try to bring uh, the best message possible. But the idea behind this message is, uh, you know, before I even read the verses, the title of the message is A Biblical Approach to Christmas. A Biblical Approach to Christmas. And and I'll give all the reasons. And uh, so just hear me out because we've got a lot of points and eventually I'll catch up to everything that you guys might think or not be not be thinking. And uh, based on, you know, just the information that I, that I have here, but it's just a biblical approach to Christmas. We're actually going to take that approach from Luke 2. But if we, if we look there in Luke 2, verse 10, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so we see there, the, the, the gist of the message is that the first thing we need to not be is afraid. And it says that, it, that the angels brought a good tidings of great joy. This was a joyous occasion, great joy, uh, a, a vast joy, which shall be to all people. So this, is, this should be a joyful occasion to everybody. Now we know if we study scripture that not everybody thinks it's a great joy to know Christ. But it says, for unto us, uh, for unto you, and this is singular, right? He's, uh, I mean, uh, plural. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. So we see that Christ was the Savior already before he had the death, burial, and resurrection because it was going to be fulfilled, which is Christ the Lord. And the reason that I, I'm bringing this message more of a, the biblical approach to Christmas is a couple of things that stand out. You know, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, as you guys know, and I mean, I, I grew up going to church all my life. I just unfortunately... I was going to the wrong church, and I was getting the wrong doctrine. But, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, just like any other uh, major false religion, will we'll talk about Christmas and the Christmas story. And they recognize Christ. Uh, they recognize that He is the Son of God. Uh, you know, they'll pervert some of the doctrine. But in, in general, the uh, gist of the story, they'll get it. The only challenge is that even after you get saved, if you go to, a, you know, a Bible-believing church or a Baptist church, when they preach uh, the Christmas messages, and I'm not talking about here because, you know, Pastor Cobb brought an, an amazing message this morning, but uh, <clears throat> one of the challenges that you find is that it's almost like they're continuing the narrative of the world. The world will sell you on this idea of Christmas uh, where it's kind of a, 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 a commingling or a mixture of Bible and, you know, what the world has told you. And so then what ends up happening is that it creates a lot of confusion and it creates a lot of uh, weird ideas or false ideas of what we're actually talking about. So I'm actually going to address this with the Bible, what the Bible says about how we should address stuff. Um, sorry, I'm waving my, my uh, kids in back there. Um, but basically what's going on here that, that I'm going to give you is just seven points. This is not a conclusive list, but if we take it straight from the Bible, of how we should approach Christmas. Because, you know, for example, the Bible gives us, and we're going to get to that, but it gives us examples of, you know, that we should, one esteemeth one day over another, and, you know, that we shouldn't judge people by the Sabbath days or the holy days and things like that. And, and the, the thing that you're going to run into is a couple of things. Number one is, even in the, in the, in the false circles or the uh, non-Bible-believing circles, you're going to hear, you, I heard this all my life, you know, some people are like, well, Christmas is a pagan holiday and it has its pagan roots and it has this. And then you hear the others who was like, well, this Christmas is a Christian holiday. And I remember even back in early 2000 when I was uh, trying to be a hardcore Republican and uh, I would listen to Rush Limbaugh uh, religiously. You know, come Christmas time, it was like there's an attack on Christmas and we're going to keep Christ in Christmas. And, but then you do all the other things too, right? They, they do all the let's go out there and, and learn about Santa Claus and learn about the elves. And so what... How should we approach holidays? How should we approach any holiday, specifically a holiday that talks about the birth of Christ? Well, the first thing that we got to do is, for example, 
we're, we're not going to approach a holiday like Halloween and say, well, you know, every, one guy, one man esteemeth one day over another. I mean, there's nothing to esteem on a day like Halloween. I mean, anything that celebrates death, it's pretty simple that if you look at the Bible, there's nothing that would even uh, back that up. But for the sake of argument, let's just say that you didn't agree with the holiday itself. The fact that Christ was born, and I said this this morning, and the fact that the, this is the greatest individual to ever be born, you know, born perfect, of a virgin, of a prophecy, you know, of, of a foreshadowing of an entire uh, plan of salvation. I mean, just on that, that note alone, we should probably celebrate Christmas every day. I mean, that's really, you know, and if you wanted to do that, more power to you. But the thing that I wanted to point out is how should we approach it biblically? What are the things that we want to do this Christmas or any Christmas moving forward on how to, how to look at, uh, you know, the, the celebration and what do we want to achieve? You know, and I don't normally do this because it's not something that you do behind a pulpit. But, you know, as, as I've grown in the ministry and as I've grown in learning how to preach, you know, you, you, you go through different processes and, and you, you read up and you learn how people prepare messages or how you're going to learn. You know, because the Bible says to do everything decent in order. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is, you know, that, you know, you, you read the Bible for what it's worth. You take it for an observation and then you, you do the interpretation and then the application. And, and one of the things that you want to look at when you're, when you're talking about a holiday like this is, okay, well, what is the Bible telling us? You know, how is it that we're going to interpret that information? And then how do we apply it to our lives? And that's really the goal. This is a very practical message. It's not one, you know, we've, the Christmas message is one that's told every year, year on out, and even the world will tell it to you. I mean, uh, I've never seen, uh, you know, uh, Snoopy's, uh, I don't even, is it Peanuts? The Peanuts, the, the Christmas story or whatever. But my wife's seen it, and one of the things that she said was that Luke 2, is preached there, you know, that they actually use the King James and they talk about it. And so the very first point that I want to make sure is go there to Luke 2, verse 10 and 11. Go there to Luke 2, verse 10 and 11. It says, uh, in verse 10 and 11, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And a couple of things we see there is the very first point is, the very first thing the Bible tells us is do not fear when, when we're talking about Jesus Christ. I mean, now a Savior is born. And I know that it's talking about because Mary saw the angel, but also I think there's a bigger application because if you look at that term, uh, fear not, in the Bible, it's used hundreds of times. It, it's used fear not like that or fear not in a, in, within the, paraphrase, the phrases, and I'm going to show you here in the Bible, so the very first thing that, that we should be encouraged about is that the birth of Christ, a remembrance of the birth of Christ, a historical account of Christ's birth, is that we had uh, the fulfillment of a prophecy that today gives us the hope of eternal life so that when we face the challenges in life, we're not afraid. We're not afraid to stand on the Word of God because the Word of God is true. The Bible tells us if you go to Genesis, and actually you, you can go to Deuteronomy. I'll just read for you Genesis 15. The first time fear not is, it's a foreshadowing of Christ. Genesis 51, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. See, we see a foreshadowing of what we're talking about this, uh, this Christmas season. It says, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is the Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So we see a couple of things here. There's the prophecy of, of what Abraham would eventually, it would be the seed of Abraham, the spiritual seed, which is now Jesus Christ. And then we see there at the end, it says, and he believed in the Lord. Well, what's our, our message? It's the salvation message. Well, you can't have the salvation message if there's no birth of Christ. You know, the Bible gives us a commandment to remember the death, burial, and resurrection. It doesn't say that we have to celebrate the, 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 the birth of Christ, but if we do take time to celebrate it, 
What a great thing to celebrate. It says, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it uh, to him for righteousness. Well, there's no way that he could have done that if he didn't understand what he was believing on, which is Jesus Christ, right? Because we know Abram understood the promise that was given to him. We're the ones that have to read our Bible through and through many times to start seeing this foreshadowing. I mean, the first few times you ever read this, you're just thinking of the physical uh, seed of Abram. But then when you get into the, the New Testament, you see that it's the spiritual seed of Israel. And we're not going to go into that. And, you know, it's interesting. It's one of the things that, that happens when you're writing sermons. I don't know if it happens to, uh, to Pastor Cobb, but you're writing a point, And each point, you're like, man, I could just write a whole sermon on this one point. And then the next point, you're like, man, I should just write a whole sermon on this point. So... For the sake of time, we're condensing this, but you should do a study on all these points. And so if we go to Deuteronomy, and uh, if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to turn, go ahead and turn to, to Joshua 1, and I'll read for you Deuteronomy, and I'll read for you uh, Revelation. But in Deuteronomy 31.6, we see that when they were about to take the promised land, he says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God, he is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. See, I know we're talking about those individual instances, but here, these are the prophecies of what he's going to do for us, even up to the point now, in 2019, when we're preaching this message, these are the promises that he's given us through his son. It says, And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord said, uh, And the Lord, he is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. See, we go back to, to uh, Luke 2.10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. This is when he's talking to the shepherds, right? Which shall be to all people. Why are they not fearing? Because the Lord is never going to leave them nor forsake them. And right there, he's, he's there saying, look, the Savior is born. The city of David, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord, is born. If we go to Revelation 1, 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So there's a lot of important doctrine and prophecy that we see with the birth of Christ. This fulfillment of all, basically the entire spectrum of, of, of the world is being fulfilled at this moment when Christ is being born. You know, in Isaiah we see the uh, prophecies being told and then we see the silence for several hundred years and then we see, you know, all of a sudden Jesus comes on the scene. Well, it has to start with the birth, the virgin birth before we can get to the miracles, before we can get to the, you know, the, the crucifixion, before we can get to the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he had to be born. We have to recognize that. Because see, that's the thing. When we're going through our gospel presentation, that's one of the things that we do. We clear up. Look, the Jesus that we're telling you to believe in is the Jesus of the Bible. And we say, look, he was born of a virgin, and he was born in a miracle of the Holy Spirit, and then he lived on the earth. We're not talking about some prophet or some... Uh, the brother of Satan, or some whatever other false religion thinks of, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the Lord Almighty. If we go there, Joshua 1, 7 and 8, it says, Only be thou strong, uh, verse 7, it says, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be, neither, uh, be not afraid, neither, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And so we see here that, the first th biblical approach is we shouldn't fear what the world tells us. See, the world writes a narrative. And the world's telling you constantly how you should think about everything. How you should approach life, how you should approach marriage, how you should approach your children, how we should celebrate Christmas. And even when, they, when, you, when they're almost right, they don't have it quite right. 
Even when I remember being younger, when everybody's like, oh, keep Christ in Christmas. It was never the gospel message. It was more of like a moral plea. You know, I'm all for keeping Christ in Christmas because it's the salvation message. It's the eternal message. But I'm also for listening to what the Bible says. Without Christ, we don't have the word because the Bible says thy word is truth. And who's the word? Jesus Christ. Right? So the first thing we see there is, you know, don't fear. And what about, what does the Bible instruct us? Is to get courage. What kind of courage? Well, we can't get any courage except God's courage. It says the, begin, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The only fear we're going to have is the fear of wisdom. And what I, why am I saying this? You know, because you say, well, you could preach that in another message. Well, the challenge is that this is the time of year where a couple of things happen. Number one, you're going to meet with family. You know, most people, that's traditional. I mean, I'm, even though things have changed in, in these United States of America, Christmas is the time of year when people get together with family and they're going to eat, they're going to be drink, they're going to drink and get married. But another thing is you have an opportunity to preach the gospel. But most people would rather write it off so that there's no contention or issues. Enough. And I'm not saying go to your family gathering and, and be a star strife, but, you know, be an example and then don't be afraid to preach the word. Then the second thing is we should be an encouragement and we should be without fear because this is the time of year also when people start getting depressed and people start having feelings of loneliness and people start having suicidal thoughts and they're discouraged and hopeless. Why is that? Because the world has said, look, if you're not with somebody in Christmas time, if you're not with your friends or family or a loved one, well then you're, uh, you're lonely and you're without hope. But the Bible is clear that our only hope is in Jesus Christ. You're never alone without Jesus Christ. See, the world has trained you so well that they expect you to celebrate Christmas in a certain way. If you don't have the checklist, then you're not celebrating Christmas. But really, the, the celebration of Jesus Christ is any time. You can do that by yourself with the Word of God. And I'm not, you know, I, if you have family and, 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 and close ones and everything and friends, enjoy it. But there's times and there's exceptions and there's people in this life that just don't have that ability. Well, if we have Christ and we're preaching Christ, maybe that's the best gift that we can give them this, this time of year. But because we're so tied up in the narrative, we might not do any of that, you know, because we're too busy watching the football game or watching whatever shows on TV or eating too much turkey or ham or whatever you're replacing it with, right? But then let's go there to Luke 2, verse 11. So just make sure you keep your finger there in Luke so you guys can see where we're headed with this. You know, Luke verse uh, 11, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And I know we, we went over it, but what did we say? It's because the other thing that the shepherds, uh, the, and then we see verse 12, it says, And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now there's another prophecy fulfilled, but the other thing that you see there is that the shepherds, they're told not to look for more than is offered. See, the challenge that we have in today, and it's, it's interesting because we were soul winning just shortly before we got here, and the last person I was able to give the, present, the gospel presentation to, she didn't want to pray because even though I showed her with verses, verse after verse, that it's only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, she couldn't get past the fact that, it was, that, you, you, couldn't, that you didn't have to uh, repent of your sins or follow the commandments or be a good person or you know, go to church. You know, and, so, and I mean, at the end, I think she agreed with me, but she just wouldn't pray. She just said that she already had prayed and, and that, all that. But, you know, the thing is that, that what's going on here is the world will do that. They add more. And around this time, what they've added is a lot more. You know, instead of just talking about the birth of Christ, you know, people talk about Santa Claus. And people talk about elves. And people talk about the magic of Christmas. And people talk about, you know, it depends on what the culture. In, in Mexico, you know, after Christmas, there's six days, and then you have the, the El Dia de los Reyes Magos, which is the day of the, 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 the wise men. You know, and, and then you celebrate the wise men, and then you get a, another cake on January, and then in February, you get a little, you know, the, what is it called, the king's cake, and you get the little doll, and then you have to, you know, they've added to the message. And so what we have to do as Christians is we stay on, on point. You know, that. The shepherd said, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, in today's uh, gospel messages that are watered down or confusing, these shepherds would go out there and be like, we're looking for a baby in swaddling clothes. And I think that it has to have certain colors. 
and we're looking for a specific, you know, they would, they would add to that. They're going to add to that. But let's look at what, what Jesus did, the Savior of the world, when he was talking about signs. Go to Matthew 12, and then we're going to be in Matthew 16. So don't look for more than an offer. See, the shepherds understood what they were dealing with. See, when you believe by faith, what does Hebrews 11 say? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, they believed on faith, but the world's always looking for that extra sign. How much more of a sign do you need than the fulfillment of a prophecy from several hundred years before? You know, you look at Matthew 12, verse 38, and it says, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, I mean, that's the point. The sign was a baby in swaddling clothes. Now he's Christ in his ministry, a grown man. And what are they saying? We would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, and that was another foreshadowing, right? So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in the judgment with this generation, shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment of, with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. You know, you think about what's going on right now, and one of the things that people want is the sign, so they've created other signs. It's not enough that we have the birth of Jesus and we have Matthew and Luke and the gospel, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but they've added to it. You know, and in past years it was Santa. It's gotten worse now. I mean, I know I'm repeating, but we're, I'm going to keep adding to that. Now it's, you know, elves, and I think they've done this thing where it's an elf on a shelf. And I don't know if you've read the back of that thing, but it's pretty wicked. You know, it's basically a, like a satanic idol. You're not supposed to touch it or do anything. If not, it won't have any magical powers. I don't know if you've seen that. You know, they, they place it in different places of the house, this little elf. It's kind of creepy looking, too. It's not a... But anyways, but what they've done is they've added other signs that confuse and muddy the water. Right here, if you go to Matthew 16, go to verse 1. <clears throat> we need to just look at what the Bible tells us. The Bible says the Savior is born. The Bible says that we believe on the Savior. He's the one that died and was buried and was risen again. But, the, but what are they looking at? Matthew 16 says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. <laughs> the sign from heaven is there. It's in front of them. It says, He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today. Uh, Today, for the sky is red and lowering, O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the sign of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. See, everybody, if you don't have a great Christmas, you know, that's usually what the world would say. It's a, it's a bad sign. It's a bad omen. But the Bible just says that all we've got to look to is the Bible for how we need to address things, right? We're not looking for more than is offered, and when we're not looking for more, then we can speak truth. You know, I said it this morning, but I'll say it again. I remember when we were little, and they brought in this Santa, and just for the sake of time, I'm not going to, you know, my, my aunt had this Santa come from my cousin, and I remember calling the guy out because I knew it wasn't Santa. It was this guy named Arturo who's now, you know, in hell because he was a sodomite all his life, but they were trying to lie to us on the fact that Santa really existed and make us believe on another sign, something magical, right? That if we were good people, we'd get gifts. If we were bad, we'd get a piece of coal. You know, it was work salvation, basically, is what they're saying, right? If you do certain things, then you can get in, and if you don't do certain things, you get out. But the Bible says if you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you're, you're in. It says, do not turn by and go back to Luke, and then we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians. The other thing that we see there in Luke 2.13, he says, And suddenly, so now we're, now we're down to verse 13, it says, And suddenly there was an angel, uh, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward man. So the other thing that we, we got to understand is, 
We're not looking for the false peace of the world. We're looking for Christ's peace. See, this is a time where people are looking for that comfort. They're looking to understand why, the, why their life is as such. I mean, that's, this is the time when, you know, uh, certain sales groups will prey on people because they're vulnerable emotionally. This is the time when emotions are running high. Because what they've done is the narrative is that this, is, this should be a perfect time of year. That everything should be perfect and, and nothing should go wrong. And you should be with family and you should drink eggnog and eat as much as you want and open as many gifts as you want and you should have money in your pocket to give other gifts. And if you don't have money in your pocket to give to your kids, you're a failure. You know, I remember being in financial services and, and one of the sales things that they did to us would make us sell more. And I'm pretty sure Pastor Cobb, you know, being in, that in, in, in sales, you probably heard this, you know, you don't want to tell your kids no. So you can write your own paycheck. And if you just sell enough, you'll never have to tell your kids no. Well, the Bible tells us no a lot. And there's nothing wrong with telling your kids no. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were discussing that maybe one year for Christmas, we, I'm not going to, you know, that's the other thing. We'll get to that point. But maybe we, as parents, we might not give our kids anything. We might encourage them to give others. Because the Bible says it's better to give than to receive. You say, well, that sounds kind of cruel. Actually, it's biblical. And it actually strengthens your character and it shows you how the world really should be, not how it is or how people tell you it is. What are people doing around? If we were to leave church right now and try to head down to uh, I-10 and Gessner, none of us would want to go because what's going on? All the traffic at the malls. Everybody's buying, you know, since Black Friday, all they've been doing is spending money and spending money and spending money to fill a void that can only be fill, filled by the eternal Son of God, right? Jesus Christ, the Savior. So whether you want to argue the point of whether you should celebrate or not, if we look at the Bible, well, they made a big deal about Christ being born. You know, it's a big deal that this miracle happened. It's a big deal that it's the birth of a virgin. I mean, unless I'm wrong, I haven't heard in the news lately, there's not been another person being born of a virgin. I don't think there's going to be one until Jesus returns. I don't think there's going to be one ever again. That's a big deal. Why do we downplay it so much? Because people aren't looking at it from a biblical perspective. Let's look at what the Bible tells us. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5, and it says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, says, But the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. I think it's interesting that, you know, the peace of the world came, uh, you know, peace and, uh, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. It was after the birth of Jesus Christ. And here he's saying, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. You know, one of the things that you're going to end up, that people do on Christmas a lot, is drink. You can't be sober if, if you're, it says there, let us watch and be sober. If you're drunk, you can't be sober. I mean, I'm just, and then they say, for they sleep, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and then they be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Uh, whether comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even, also, even as also ye do. So the Bible tells us that when the world tells you there's peace, that sudden destruction is going to come. And I, I was going to include other verses, but like I said, each one of these should be its own sermon point. But you know, we, we also see that when they cry, peace, peace, they have no peace. What was the Bible tells us? Go to John 14, verse 26. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. What things? The things that are found in the Word of God. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so we see the fulfillment of peace, of the peace that passes all understanding. 
And, you know, we could do a whole sermon just on peace alone, but this is an important time in history. And, you know, one of the things that, that they don't emphasize, or maybe they do, I just, I haven't heard it, you know, and they did it, they did it. Luckily, I'm still that generation where public school wasn't as bad, or maybe, maybe the generations that come be behind me will say that, but, you know, they would emphasize history and the importance of knowing, you know, what your history is. Well, for us, this is a biblical historical event. This is what determines the walk of Jesus in his life. This is what determines, you know, when he's going to be uh, uh, betrayed by Judas Iscariot. This, without the birth of Jesus, we can't have death. Without the birth of Jesus, we can't have the rest of the Gospels. I mean, the birth of Jesus is a very important event. This is the greatest uh, human to ever walk the earth, human God. I mean, of course, we know John the Baptist was the greatest human in the flesh, but Jesus was God, and he was man, 100%. So go to there to go back to Luke. Let's go to Luke uh, 2.15. Let's keep reading. And the reason I'm, I'm doing this is because, you know, when you get around family, after the niceties go, and after, you know, you've spent a couple of minutes, hours, it all depends on how well you get with your family, the topics that matter come up to the surface, and you end up talking about things that matter to people. And if you don't know your Bible, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, you can't be a witness and you can't preach the gospel of Christ. And people are looking. You'd be surprised how many people are, pay attention to what you do in your life. And I'm not preaching a lifestyle evangelism. I'm just saying our testimony is important. The Bible says to preach. But some people won't ask you uh, anything or you won't have the opportunity to preach if you're part of the world because they won't think that you're any different than them. You know, if there's no difference... Why would I ask you for advice? You know, I wouldn't ask anybody that, you know, some of my friends that I know don't know anything about mechanics just like me. You know, I've known because I've grown up around them. Why would I ask them about mechanics if they don't know anything about mechanics? You know, but if my friend Trey, who, who comes uh, uh, to church on a regular basis, he grew up in a mechanic shop. He's a master mechanic. His lifestyle, you know, his hands have, he's always got dirty hands and they've got the calluses. Mine, mine aren't like that, right? That's someone I would ask about how, to, how some mechanical stuff works. Well, if I'm out there being a Christian, supposedly, but I'm still drinking and partaking in Santa and all the things of the world, why would anybody be interested in what I have to say about God's Word? You know, the Bible gives us a very clear biblical perspective of how we should address things in this world. It says, do not, uh, right here, go to Luke 2.15. Let's focus on that. It says, and it came to pass, as the angels were gone away, from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go now, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary, Joseph, and the babe lying in the manger. I love that word haste. You know, people have told me, don't do things in haste because it creates waste. And that is true, but the Bible, when it uses the word haste, is usually for a good thing. You know, if you read the the, the, the story of David against Goliath, it says that David ran hastily towards the battle. You know, when, we, when God gives us a command and when he tells us some truth, we should immediately respond to it. This shouldn't be, we shouldn't procrastinate. We shouldn't sit around twiddling our thumbs. We shouldn't be like, well, I read and I heard and I've been told. And then you don't do anything. You know, the Bible says they ran haste and they found Mary and Joseph in the babe line in the manger. 2 Corinthians 6, and in the meantime, just go to stay there in Luke. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. See, they didn't just sit around twiddling their thumbs. That's vain and unfruitful. They went and witnessed this thing. For us, our gospel message, when we get out there and we get on fire for the Lord, that's when, we're in, when we run to haste, right? It says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation, have I succored thee? Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. See, every day that we're with somebody is a day of salvation. This is a great opportunity. This is one of the greatest harvesting opportunities, in my opinion, if you approach it right. If you have a biblical approach to how you're going to deal with people. Because, I mean, believe me, if you've been around long enough, you're going to get into all kinds of conversations. But the only conversations that matter are the eternal ones. You know, and I'm not saying shove it down people's throats and wear them out. The Bible says, you know, admonish a heretic once or twice and then move on. I'm not saying, but in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, you have a little bit more opportunity to go deeper into the Word of God than when you're door knocking, right? 
that you don't get those opportunities very often. But when you're with family and with friends, this is an opportunity to do above and beyond. And let me tell you something. I can guarantee you that most people have family that aren't saved. And that you're going to be with family that's not saved, and they're depressed, and they're hopeless, and they're looking. Because that's just the norm. I mean, look at the statistics. I don't, I didn't, I don't have to print them up because it's, it's been known for years that Christmas is a time in January, right, right towards the beginning of January, people are depressed or they're planning for the next year. They're rounding out the year and they're looking for the next year and they're looking to do something important. That's why you get all these New Year resolutions that fail 30 days later, five days later, a day later. That's why you get all this. They're resolute to do something new, but the Bible says, look, if we give them Christ, they have the renewing of the mind. Then they know that they can have goals with purpose, but we've got to be able to address it biblically. Let's go to... Luke 2.20 says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, and it was told as it was told unto them. So they didn't procrastinate, and now, they say, uh, you know, now they're speaking the truth. Right? They're not speaking and believing lies. They're speaking the truth. They said, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. See, we know... And, and I mean, honestly, I could have done, there was so much, I had to really tone it down. But we know Herod asked and inquired of the wise men, but not for truth, but for deception, for wanting to, you know, and eventually he actually slaughtered a bunch of babies to kill the Christ, to kill Jesus Christ. So, you know, the Pharisees were always looking for the sign, and then they were always lying to everybody. But, the, but when you have Christ in your life, you're speaking the truth. Well, look, there's a lot of truth that you need to clean up when you're around family. You know, I'm going to end with that, so I'm not going to get distracted. But look at John 1, 12. No, actually, just stay there in Luke. I'll just read these real quick. What does the Bible say? But as many as received them, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. In John 1, 12, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. That's the birth of Christ. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, the only truth that we can preach at the end of the day is the truth of Jesus Christ, is the truth of the Bible. You know, there's, there's all kinds of truth, but there's absolute truth in God's word. It says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, the word couldn't, we couldn't be holding this word here if we didn't have the birth of Jesus Christ. So, you know, when it comes to how should we biblically approach Christmas, you know, we should be glad that Jesus Christ came to this earth and that he was born of a virgin so that he could die on the cross for us. This is a great time. It's a joyous occasion. You say, well, you know, because I've heard the arguments, Jesus was born, you know, we, in March or in early June. We've heard, well, the Bible doesn't clearly tell us when he was born. And, you know, I've also heard the arguments that, you know, this is the winter solstice and all this stuff. But the, the reality is that you know, if I wanted to celebrate this again in, in January, the Bible gives me commandment to do so. It gives me liberty to do so. I'm going to give you those verses here in a second. In Psalms 25, 4, it says, Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. Oh, on thee I, do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. You know, we see that the truth was fulfilled when Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. Let's look at uh, Luke 2.30. He says, uh, this is later on in the passage. And, and you know what? Just to read it in context uh, real quick. Let's go to Luke 27. Uh, Luke, um, Luke 2.25. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this is, by the way, uh, my father-in-law is on his way, but if he, if he listens to this message, this is like his favorite part of the Christmas story. He has a... Uh, uh, a puzzle that he does of, you know, this drawn out puzzle where Simeon's holding, you know, like an image of Jesus, like the baby Jesus, you know, you've seen those where they draw them out and you do a puzzle. He really loves this part of the story. It just made me think of him. So if my father in law is listening, hey, father in law. But it says there, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had see, uh, seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took, him up, uh, took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, 
Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Uh, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. You know, for us, the word of God, when someone preaches the word of God, we've seen Christ's salvation. I know it's faith is the substance of things hope, hope for, the evidence of things not seen, but we have the word of God. We have it with us today. It says uh, in Colossians 2.16, it says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. So what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here, because I've given you all this, is that how do we biblically approach something like this? You're going to hear a lot of stuff when you're, you know, when you're out there and you, especially, you know, it's what's interesting is all of a sudden people's opinions become really strong when they find out that you're saved and that you're sold out for Christ. It's interesting how nobody cared what you thought until all of a sudden they know you have Jesus in your life. And then all of a sudden, everybody got, has an opinion on what they think is a historical, accurate account of everything. You know, and the Bible tells us there in Colossians 2.16, go to Romans 14.5 while I'm reading Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. What I'm trying to say here is that, you know, there's certain things in the Bible that are, that are like, we, we're unmovable in that. We, we, don't, we don't move on the gospel message. That's why I use Luke 2.30, right? For mine eyes have seen this, thy salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But then there's certain things that, you know, God gives us liberty. But he says, look, if you're going to do these things, you have to have a certain uh, way of approaching it. So, for example, the, way that I, the easiest way for me to explain it is, I was a Seventh-day Adventist, and we went to church on Saturday. Now, according to the Bible, I could continue worshiping on Saturday if my heart and I read the Bible and that's really what I believed the Bible was saying. But the challenge with going to church on Saturday is that most people aren't telling you to go to church on Saturday because they think it's a good thing. They're telling you to go to church on Saturday because that's the only way to heaven. See the difference? You know, if, if somebody came into this church and said, look, I think that we should worship on Saturday and Sunday. I'd be like, look, you can worship on Saturday and you can still come on Sunday. Just that's your choice. If you feel that that's where the Lord lets you, but you shouldn't be shoving it down anybody's throat and you shouldn't be trying to convince anybody of it. Most of the time, though, that's what happens, right? They're not doing it for the cause that they think or believe that they read something in the Bible that they might understand. No, they're doing it because they're trying to convince everybody to do it also. And so when it comes to something like Christmas, you know, because these are the conversations that are had is people will give you all this, you know, I've heard those arguments before, there's documentaries on it, and then they say, you know, it comes from this, and it comes from that, and all this stuff. And you know what? There's some truth to what they're saying, but at the end of the day, we're going to be around our families and friends. The time is given to celebrate this moment. People are given time off. Well, why not stick to God's word? Why go off into the abyss? And the other thing is, why try to shut? If somebody says that they don't want to celebrate Christmas, because, you know, that's what they believe the Bible has led them to. Hey, I'm not going to tell them anything. The Bible tells me not to judge them in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. The only thing is, I'm not going to try to shove my belief down their throat on that day and vice versa. See, because then you're getting off track. Now, if they're trying to tell me that if I celebrate Christmas, I'm going to hell, well, that's a whole other conversation, right? Now we're talking, you know, now we're dealing in another, in another doctrine, in another topic. As a matter of fact, if you read in Romans 14, verse 5, it says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not. And and give it God thanks. So when we're, when we're going to celebrate it, and honestly, we could take this, this message and just be a biblical approach to any day of celebration, is what are we trying to accomplish? Is it for the Lord? Or is it not? You know, one of the things that, that I know pastors very, Pastor Cobb's very careful with is the Lord's Supper. Because it's unto the Lord. You, you know, and the Bible gives us very specific instruction that there's, if you're not right with the Lord and if people aren't saved, it shouldn't be, people shouldn't partake it, right? That's a very specific thing. But when it comes to 
uh, Christmas, it gives us the celebration of Christ, you know, the shepherds and the angels and the host, but that's it. So if people want to argue these points, don't get off track. Keep, keep the main thing the main thing. You know, the biblical approach is that the birth of Christ was a big deal. And it's a big deal because it's the only way to fulfill the prophecy of his death, burial, and resurrection. In John 6, 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. You know, it's interesting. Is the reason I picked that is that's, that's it. That's the goal right there is to get people right with God. And then the other thing that I believe is, is soul winning is not enough. You know, we need, like I said before, we need strong preaching on the Word of God. And I'm going to close out with this is, you know, don't partake in worldly Christmas traditions. You know, live, die to Christ daily, live for Christ, be that example and preach the Word. You know, in Luke 2.49, at the end of, the, of, of Luke 2, you know, Jesus is now 12 years old and they go and uh, let's go a few verses up. Uh, in Luke 20, in Luke 49, but let's go over to uh, 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple. So, you know, Jesus and his family had gone to uh, Nazareth for the feast of the Passover, and now they're going back and they realize, hey, Jesus is not with us, right? And it came to pass after three, three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, here's one of those things where, you know, she's trying to say this is the way things should be done. You know, write the narrative. But Christ is, is going to respond. I love the response. That, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? See, the thing, the main thing that we need to keep in our lives when we're celebrating anything is, are we about the father's business? Right? The world will try to confuse you. The world says, Hey, here's some good Christmas traditions. Write Santa a letter. Look, Santa doesn't exist. There's no letter to write him. Right? And it's a dangerous lie because it teaches work salvation. You know, people say, well, it's also the winter solstice. Well, I mean, that's just, that's just nature. This is the shortest day of the year, 25th and 26th. You know, and yeah, I know that there's pagan uh, traditions behind that. You know what? I don't have to partake in any pagan tradition. Halloween came and, 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 and went by, and I didn't celebrate Halloween. I didn't have anything to do with the devil. I didn't invoke his name. I didn't go and sacrifice anything. You know, I didn't call on witches. Uh, they're like, oh, we'll put those elves on the shelves. I don't know what it, I mean, I might be an elf. I'm five foot five and a half, so I don't know, you know, how tall elves are. But, the, you know, I'm not partaking in, in the mystical and the mysterious. The, uh, mandatory gifting. Why? Why do we have to give everybody a gift? I and mean, if you're going to give a gift, you know, why should it be a, a material gift? Give the gift of eternal life. Go out there and soul win a little bit. You know, go out there and preach the word of Christ. You know, people are then, then the other thing you're going to end up running into is there's a lot of worldly parties drinking. What happens in all these, these parties? Adultery, you know, fornication, drug use. You don't have to go to the Christmas party. Oh, well, my boss is going to be there. You know what? You got a boss in heaven. He can take care of your job. He can take care of your family. Or do you not have faith enough for this, right? The challenge is everybody wants to be a world pleaser. Or, you know, the one that gets me the most is what kind of Christmas songs you're going to sing? Well, the only Christmas songs I'm going to sing are hymns from the from the uh, hymnal, and you know what? I've actually been in church long enough to where they've taken what we call Christmas songs, and throughout the year, sometimes you'll hear them played because it's just a hymn. It's a Christian hymn. There's nothing wrong with singing about Christ and His birth any time of the year. As a matter of fact, that's a great uh, you know that's a great thing to do. Go to Galatians 5 verse 22, and we'll close out with that. You know, the Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit. It says. 522 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affectionate, the affections and, and lusts. We live in the Spirit. Let us also walk in the Spirit. 
Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So, in closing, what's the biblical approach to Christmas is that we should walk in the Spirit, that we should have the fruit of the Spirit, right? That Christ should dwell in us, that we should walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desiring a vainglory. You know, vainglory, that word vain means fruitless. There's a lot of things that are going to occur in the next couple of days that are fruitless, that are just, they mean nothing. You know, I'm not opposed to you eating, but there's no need to overeat. I'm not opposed to you hanging out with family. There's no point in, you know, the Bible says, you know, we shouldn't idle words or partake in those. What we need to do is just talk about Christ, and we need to have a, a, a Christ-like approach or a biblical approach to the way we do things, right? If we're going to have traditions, I mean, a meal with family and enjoying a, a time of fellowship, I mean, you can do that outside of Christmas, and that's still a really good time. The challenge is when you start adding all the other things, right? Like the Santa Claus and all these things. And if you're going to give a gift, give it for the right reasons. I'm not, a, I'm not saying don't give gifts. I'm just saying that shouldn't be the main goal. I remember when I was little, that's all we ever wanted. And then you get the gift. I mean, think about how trained and the narrative was. And I'll close out with that. Is I remember getting gifts that we didn't like and being ungrateful as a child. Being like, oh, this is not what I want. And then you just kind of throw it to the side. That's not a biblical, God says to be content with whatsoever, uh, in whatsoever state we are. Well, sometimes the state is, it's a gift that you might not be so excited about, but thank you, Lord, for the gift anyways, right? Thank you, Lord, for the money that I have now or the money that I didn't have now. Thank you, Lord, for the family that I have today and the family I don't have tomorrow. Thank you for the opportunity to have the health to go out there and knock doors today because I might not be able to do that tomorrow. We don't know what, what, what the future holds, but we know what we can do right now. The biblical approach to any day should be, as a matter of fact, I'll just throw out the, the name of the message. This should just be your biblical approach to every day. You know, every day we should let the Word of God guide us so that we know how to deal with other people, so that we know how to deal with situations. Because what happens is, and it's going to happen, maybe you're not dealing with it, but, you know, it happens when you're out there and you're trying to talk to people all the time, you're going to hear stuff like that. You hear people just trying to confuse the gospel message. You're trying to get people to discredit the word of God. You're trying to get, you're hearing people that say things. But the reality is that if we believe this is a historical, historical account and we want to, you know, focus on one and celebrate it for the cause that it is, then, you know, as long as we do it in the right context, there's nothing wrong with that. That's my opinion based on what we've read in the Bible. So maybe it's not so much of an opinion, but some biblical proof that I gave you. But let's go, go ahead and close in a word of prayer. And hopefully that was a, it was more of a pragmatic a, approach to the whole thing. So hopefully that helped. But Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the message, Lord. You know, I, this is an important message, I, I think, to a lot of people that maybe grew up in my generation where Christmas was a big deal in the sense that, you know, it was about Santa. It was about the gifts. It was about the traditions. It was about all the wrong things. You know, when you get saved, you realize that it's the message and the miracles and the prophecy and the power that is behind your word, Lord. And, and you, you have a different appreciation for what, uh, you know, what the days are and how you redeem the time and how you focus on the things. And my prayer is that uh, not only our family, but any family that's growing in Christ would raise up their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord so that... The days are special because we have Christ, not because the world has told us that that's the special day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.